What a blessing it has been already to be in God's presence. Anybody else just love getting to worship with the family of God? Amen. And uh, I just am so thrilled to get to be with you this morning. And uh, I want to say a big thanks to Pastor Mark for uh, the great word brought last week. We've been going through a really unique series. We plan to do this annually to where uh, in Easter we gave you a survey of, of different topics that you might be interested in hearing or you could submit your own. And we took the top ones and developed a response. We took a few months to, you know, that was back in April and here we are almost done with September. I can't believe that. And tried to respond to some of the issues at hand. We talked about, uh, you know, the challenge of forgiving others and forgiving ourselves. One week we dealt with uh, the issue of stress, being stressed out. And uh, last week was about just the fundamentals of the family and, and you know, how to, how to be that family member, that parent, that, that uh, spouse, whatever it might be that God has called you to be. Uh, scripture gives us instruction for everything if we'll look to Scripture for everything. Can somebody say amen to that? Amen. And uh, today's issue as we kind of close out this series, it actually, y'all didn't plan it this way, but it's just uh, beautiful how God works things out, will really lead us in really well to our next month's uh, message series. Next month's message series is called Masquerade. It's about unmasking things uh, that may seem really overwhelming, really scary, maybe things that you've hidden in your heart, in your life, or just things in the world around you, about how to look at them in a different way so that they don't overwhelm you and so that you can be an overcomer in this world. And so I'm really excited about that. And today really can serve as a lead-in, an intro. Uh, today we're going to talk about the, the subject of how to change. So many people have asked in one form or another, how can I you know, be better than I was yesterday? Or why have I been struggling with this same problem, this same temptation? Uh, you know, it doesn't always have to be something necessarily evil that you're doing that you want to change. How many of you don't like feeling depressed? How many of you don't like feeling worried and stressed? Those are things you would want to change as well. And can I tell you some good news? Jesus covered it all when he paid for our sin and our shame. Anything in your life, he died for it so that not only would you just get through life, he wanted you to have life and have it more abundant. Y'all already know the scripture. So now is the part where we're going to try to put this scripture into practice in a practical way in our lives. I want to direct your attention if you want to follow along with me in your message notes. And if you're a guest today, we provide free little three-ring binders. I'd love if you'd like to take one. You can keep your message notes, and hopefully you'll come back and just uh, be able to follow along with us as we study the Word together. But in Romans chapter 7, verse 15, it says, I don't understand myself at all. And I want you to personalize this. The Apostle Paul is writing these words, but think of it as you saying it. I don't understand myself at all. For I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Can anybody relate to that? In fact, it, it even says it uh, with more emphasis in the next line. It says, instead, I do the very thing I hate. Can I ask you please to pray with me, and, and please pray for me, that God would just speak to us today from his word as he wants it to be directed to us. Heavenly Father, we are here in your presence to honor you and to reverence you. And Holy Spirit, I ask for you to move in our hearts and our lives so that the Word of God can not only be heard, but be done in our lives. So God, let us be good soil to receive it and let us live out what you speak to us today. In Jesus' name, in all in agreement said, amen, amen and amen. As, as we look at this topic, this message series, uh, you asked for it. And, and how do you change things in your life I want to try to be relatable to you. Uh, I've actually made a commitment. It's been over a little, a little over a month now. feels like a lot longer than that. Uh, to where I made a commitment to want to change something in my life. It's been a struggle for me for a lot of years. Uh, it's, it's been something that I have tried to... Uh, any of y'all ever had a habit that you've stopped for months at a time and then it just creeps back in? or a mindset, or, or a, you know, a response to somebody. You think you've forgiven them, and then all of a sudden, there it is again when something else is said. And it's something I've dealt with and struggled with, and I really uh, have been doing very good. And that, that verse of Scripture where it says, you know, I really want to do what is right, but I don't do it, uh, applies to me a lot of times in life. It's applied to me a lot on my journey as a follower of Jesus. And just 
uh, this last week. I've been going really strong, and it seems like the Lord always works things into my life about kind of what we're going to be talking about, because I think it helps teach me so that hopefully I can better convey the message to you. And I found myself just face-to-face uh, with my temptation. In fact, uh, I wasn't expecting to see it. You ever seen somebody completely out of place, somebody you didn't want to run into, and then you just bump into them and it's the most awkward thing? That's kind of what this was like, except I was walking in a convenience store and there was a giant display of Dr. Pepper, which I haven't had a sip of that sweet nectar of the gods for over a month. And I've been doing really well. And now I'm dead serious. I went into that convenience store for my convenience to get a bottle of water. I didn't go into there to get Dr. Pepper. You understand me? But oh, it looks so good. (laughs) And I, I really, after a couple of weeks, had got to where I don't really crave it. I haven't had any with meals Y'all, I've even eaten Mexican food, chips and salsa with no Dr. Pepper. Hallelujah. That is true deliverance, saints. But I don't know what it was. I'd kind of had a a difficult day. And this may seem silly to you, but you got to understand, self-discipline is never really silly. And I stood there having a conversation with myself. The poor lady that was behind the register probably wondered what I was doing because I walked away from the display, went and grabbed my water bottle, and walked back just to look at it one more time. <laughs> you know, because they've got it out for football and all that, and it had a Dallas Cowboys thing. Now, now the enemy's just really tempting me, because I want to support my team. If you love the Cowboys, you drink Dr. Pepper. Praise the Lord. But really, I got kind of frustrated at myself. And, and, and really, I just, I, I, I'm saying it lighthearted. But in the moment, I was like, why is this such a big deal to me? Because here's the truth I know. I have a lot of more important things. And, and don't get me wrong, eating healthy is very important. And y'all, Dr. Pepper, don't do me any good. And, and I, I know that. And so I'm trying to make some wise choices. But I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of other relationship decisions, uh, business decisions, spiritual decisions that, that I face that are more important than that. And I don't want to be just driven by something that doesn't do me any good. Can somebody say amen to that? This is what I'm talking about, those things that we need to change, that you want to change. I don't understand myself. That's how I felt. I was like, what is wrong with me that I just want to look at it and gaze at all the glory of its maroon wrapping, you know? Well, what is that? I mean, it's, it kind of bothered me. And think of things in your life, temptations, habits, feelings that you don't want to go back to. Maybe even uh, things like secret sins nobody else knows about. And you feel like if they knew, they would hate you. You hate that you do it. You hate that you give in to it. Yet there you go back. The Bible says like a dog returns to its vomit. Sometimes people will return to their sins. That's what it feels like. You're like, I'm grossed out by it. I know it's not going to make me feel better after I do it, but I'm drawn to it. We need help in that way. I want to kind of, uh, I guess, reverse engineer this first. Because I want to walk through a list with you, if you'll fill in these blanks, of what happens to get you to the point where you've got something that you can't change, and it's changing you. It's affecting your decisions and your emotions, your spiritual life, whatever. The first thing that happens is something, it becomes a part of your identity. Some of you have things in your life that may be, they they were passed down for generations. Uh, You know, people do Ancestry.com and find out that their family's like kin to royalty or like a celebrity. Uh, My great-granddaddy was famous for being an Alcatraz at the same time as Al Capone because he helped him bootleg. That's about as far back as we can go because we didn't even keep any records much past that. And, uh, you know, I don't have a long line. I come from a long line of alcoholism and abuse, actually. In fact, my father ran away from home here in Iowa Park, Texas, a night after his father had pulled a gun on his mom, and my dad was about to beat him over the head with a, with a rock, but he passed out drunk before he could pull the trigger. So again, sometimes we see people, you know, in their little fancy suit coats or whatever and think, boy, they just come from good stock. I didn't necessarily. But can I tell you, because of some changes my dad made, my children, his grandchildren, will never know that lifestyle. They'll never know that fear of when's dad going to come home or almost wishing that he wouldn't come home. I don't know if you've ever had a parent that was abusive to where you almost didn't want to see them 
or a person in your life that well, there was so much friction and, and pain caused when they're around, you almost didn't like them being around. The, some things needed to change there. But some people think, that's just who I am. That's who I come from. That's what my last name is. So I'm always going to be that way. Or even if it's not from somebody else, you've just done it long enough that you're like, this is the, I, this is the, the me that I've created. And you're just stuck in this cycle. And now you identify with that sin, with those bad feelings, with that depression, whatever it is. And it leads you to the next step where you feel increasingly hopeless. Again, first you just kind of identify. Some people try to own it, I think. To say, well, that's just how I am. as a defense mechanism. But what you're really confessing is, I can't beat this. It's beating me. And you begin to feel hopeless in that way. You, you start feeling things like, this is you know, the way it's always going to be because it's the way it's always been. Which can lead right into the next thing where you become defensive. Now you'll notice this when people try to help you and you withdraw from them. You're afraid of being disappointed again in yourself that you can't beat this thing and you don't want to be embarrassed that they get to see you go through that same pain. You get defensive. You'll even start to deny it. Whatever you can do to just try to avoid it, but yet it's still there in your life. Those things that you want to change, like the Bible said, I do the very thing I hate. And again, it may not be you know, necessarily an addiction. It might be like drugs or alcohol, but it may be something emotional. It, it may be something you know, spiritual, whatever it might be. You get defensive about it, and that leads you to become a slave to whatever that is. That's your next blank. Now it's in control. You literally make decisions because of this problem in your heart and life. And y'all know what I mean. Like, you avoid certain people, which sometimes that can be a good thing. You don't need to let toxic people, you know, just latch on to you and, and harass you. That's fine. But I'm saying, you're starting to avoid people who love you. You're starting to hide things. You know what I'm saying? You're a slave to it. It makes you lie because you don't want to admit that you're struggling with it. Even if you're lying to yourself. And I know this is heavy. I'm, 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 can I tell you, I'm not trying to put more burden on you, but I want you to see the severity of what happens. Because the final step is, this is what the enemy wants to happen. You begin to lose your life. Like I said, you literally, it's changed the way you feel. It changes the way you interact with other people. Maybe most importantly, it changes the way you feel about yourself. And y'all, it might be something somebody else did to you, but now it's taken root in your heart. It's changed the way you view yourself, the way you value yourself. And that's a dangerous place to be. I just want to share a thought with you before we go on. Is that when, when Jesus saves you, and, and you really give your heart to the Lord, always remember this, God doesn't want to improve the old you. This isn't in your notes, I just want you to remember this. He's not just trying to improve the old you he wants to create a whole new you and so i love uh, our ministry that we have called to celebrate recovery we have a, a, a course called freedom that deals with things like this we, we offer many ministries uh, for this type of you know thing that whatever it might be like i said it doesn't have to be just a habit any kind of hang up in your life and I've had a lot of history. I worked in the Metroplex with like Tarrant County's MHMR. Did a lot of AA, NA type things. And there's a lot of value to that. And 12-step programs like that. But the one thing that's always, I've, I've stopped short of fully supporting about them is that even if you've been clean or sober for many, many years, if you go through AA, NA, you know, which is alcohol, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, even if you go through it for a long time, they want you to introduce yourself and say, hi, I'm an alcoholic, or hi, I'm a drug addict. Y'all, we need to be really careful putting those kind of labels on ourselves, because you know what? God doesn't. He says, anyone who is in Christ is no longer an alcoholic, no longer a drug addict, no longer a depressed victim, no longer an abuse victim. He says, we are a new creation. Again, He's not trying to improve the old you, where you've got to bring the old you there and just try to clean it up. There's a brand new start. Covered by the blood of Jesus. You get a do-over. Take it. Amen. Amen. In fact, the Bible even says you get a new name written down in glory. So if you don't like your old name, your old last name, God's got a brand new one for you that he picked for you. Other people may try to call you names that you don't like. A failure, a mistake, just confused, frustrating, whatever it might be. That's not the name that God has for you. You're victorious because of what Jesus Christ did for you. 
So, yeah, that sounds really good. And I, man, I, I could just preach right there and get us all shouting because I feel pumped up about that. It's good news. But some of y'all still, you've been inspired, you've been pumped up before, and then Monday came, and you walked past your Dr. Pepper display. They got an extra large. God bless you, sister. You're my people. Uh, yeah, if you're going to do it, go big. That's what it feels like, isn't it? Though? Sometimes, really, we, we feel that way. It's like, well, I've failed so many times, so if I'm going to fail this time, I'll just go all in. That's what leads people to give up on life, to give up their life, literally. Uh, you know, to, to think that this world would be better off without them. What a lie of the enemy. There's so many people that love you, so many people care about you. But again, if you, if you go down this path of becoming, letting it be your identity, you'll feel hopeless, defensive, you'll be a slave to it, and you'll begin to lose your life, and hopefully not ultimately. So how to change. Here's what I want you to do before we walk through this final part of today's message, is I want you to fill in the blank just mentally. You may even want to write it down. It's okay if only you look at it. I'm not trying to get you to air your laundry to everybody. But I really want you to do this with me. Fill in the blank to this sentence in your mind, in your heart. If I could only change this, whatever it might be. Maybe it's one thing, maybe it's several. It just, I just wish I was better at, about this. Or I wish I didn't do this anymore. I wish this didn't have that effect on me. Get that in your heart. Get that in your spirit for a moment. Because we want to confront that together today with the word of God. See, Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 14, gives us instruction on how to change. It says, do not let sin control the way you live. Do not give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. That's really what we're doing when we're giving in to those things that are not of God. And please understand this. We like to classify stuff. And say, well, at least I'm not robbing banks. You know, or whatever. But really, there's no level of sin with God. Sin is sin. The Bible says even all liars will have their place in the lake of fire. And so when you think about this, anything that's not of God, guess what? Is not of God. So if it's not of him, it's of the enemy. And, and you need to examine your heart. And, and it says you don't want to be an instrument. Instead, give yourselves completely to God. And, and if you would underline that even, if you don't mind. Because if I could tell you in a sentence, and we're going to walk through some practical ways because this is just a big phrase, but in a sentence how you want to change your life, give yourself completely to God. Because you can't do it by yourself. Spoiler alert, you're going to need God's help. And too many people don't get this, even Christians. And we try to do it on our own. We're embarrassed or we're shy or we're, we feel overwhelmed, frustrated. So we just think, I'll just deal with this because I don't want anybody else to know what I'm dealing with. That never works out. Never does. It goes on to say, once you do that, that sin is no longer your master. Instead, this is the good part, you live under the freedom of God's grace. And what the good news of God's grace, God's grace is not a license to sin. It's, it's God's faith in you to say you can do better. You don't have to sin anymore. And, and you may be like, but I'm not ever going to be perfect. What are, are you trying to be like Jesus or not? Again, if you identify with that old you and you say, I'm just always going to be that way, are you still going to be that way in heaven? Of course not. So we need to start working and walking that direction. God will help you. If you do your part, he'll more than meet you halfway. And so you need to start thinking, I want to live in the freedom of God's grace, not bound to my past, not bound to my mistakes, not bound to what I did yesterday, what I did five minutes ago. You can have a fresh start right now from this point on. And there, there's three quick ways that I want to go over with you that you need to do if you really want to change. Number one, maybe the most difficult, you've got to get rid of the excuses. We've all got them. Well, I can't change, especially people that are stuck in that defensive part. Well, I can't change because I'm just so stressed in life. We talked about how to deal with that a couple weeks ago. You may need to go back and listen to that message. Stress should not, you shouldn't be a slave to stress. And you know what? If you're a slave to your schedule, you know what you may need to change? Your schedule. 
See what stuff can I really do? If it's like, I, I'm having to work all this to pay all this stuff, see how much stuff you're actually paying for that you really couldn't just live without. You may not need 5,000 TV channels. <laughs> and can I tell you, if that buys you peace of mind, get rid of it. Amen? Uh, you know, I had somebody tell me one time that they were really struggling with their cell phone. He's like, I just, you know, I have access to the internet at all times. And I was like, well, why don't you just get a phone that can't connect to the internet? They have those. Remember those old flip phones or whatever? And literally he was responsible, what will I do if I can't connect to the internet? Well, I'll tell you what you won't do. It's that thing that you were trying to stop. You know, it overwhelmed him. And when he really got to thinking about that, he did it. And for a year, had that kind of a cell phone. And can I tell you, it saved his marriage. It saved his, his, he got off, he got off of some antidepressants because he, he realized, and y'all, I'm not trying to say that if you're on antidepressants, it's not real. Depression is a real thing. It hurts. It is spiritual and physical. And anyone that deals with it, you have my, my deepest prayers and, and I want you to be free from it. But can I show you, it always stems from somewhere. And this man realized in dealing with that secret sin, part of why he was so depressed, he didn't like himself. He didn't like looking at his wife and kids knowing what he was looking at on his phone. Away from them. And when he got free of that, all these other things he started, that's that freedom of the grace of God that we're talking about here. But you got to get rid of the excuses. you got to quit talking about why I can't do it and start to say why I can. Now, it says in Luke chapter 14 that they all be alike begin to make excuses. This is a parable that Jesus tells. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. They had all been invited to this great banquet by the king. And instead of going to that, they had all these other things that were way less important and impressive than getting to go to this you know, celebration with the king. And, and this, this master of the house finally said, go find me people that want to be here. Go into the, the highways and the byways and bring them to my table. This is a picture of, of God in heaven looking out saying, y'all, I just want to bless you. I just want to give you everything. But we'll say, yeah, but God, I'm so busy. I, you know, I need my social media, even though it makes me judge myself because everybody else looks like their life is better than mine because their filters are better than mine. Yeah, God, I, I need all this stuff because it makes me feel better, but I'm struggling to find ways to pay for all of it. Again, we got to examine. Don't be a slave to these things. Don't, and the key here, what that first scripture we read where it talks about being an instrument that serves sin, what's happening when you're an instrument of sin is you're letting it call the shots in your life. So stop making excuses of why you can't change and understand how important it is that you do change. Now, when you stop making excuses, here's your next step. When you say, I'm just going to do it. From this day, I'm going to do it. I'm going to make a difference. You need to make a break from some of those things. Like I told you about the cell phone for that guy. Whatever it might be for you. It might be certain people. Again, I'm not telling you to avoid, don't put up walls so that good people can't get in. But y'all, if you know you're in a relationship with somebody you don't need to be in a relationship with, don't look at God and say, why is my life going this way? It's because we're choosing it. If, if you're in a, a work environment that, that is really overwhelming you and you're struggling with, y'all... Get on monster.com, find, you know, find you another job if you have to. I've talked to some of y'all that have done that, and you're the happiest I've ever seen you once you got in a new, new work situation. Don't be a slave to anything. If, if there's certain things in your life you may not even recognize, you really need to stop and evaluate. I talked to one young man recently who was struggling with anger issues. And I actually heard somebody talking to me about this this morning, someone even younger, but... This, this young man, he was a young adult, and he was saying, I just, I'm struggling with hate and, and anger. I get so mad so quick. I just let him talk and tell me about his day and things that he goes through. We came to the, what he was listening to and what he was watching. Can I tell you, pretty much all that boy listened to and watched was violence and heavy metal music that was talking about killing people or fighting people or being mad all the time. Again, if you want to... If you want to overcome anger in your life, you need to make a break with those things. It might be feeding that. You, you do understand, you are more of a spiritual being than you are a physical being. And so, you may not realize these physical things are affecting you spiritually. And again, if you're depressed all the time, if you're sad all the time, you may need to look, what in my life is making me feel that way? 
If you're, if you're angry all the time, if you're worried all the time, who is speaking into your life? What are you allowing into your life? That's, make a break with it. 2 Corinthians 6.14 says, Do not be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? It goes on just to say, you know, come out of it and be separate. But I, I want to focus on that word yoked. Don't be yoked together. And when it says unbelievers, really anything that is pulling you away from God, uh, this, this generation, myself included, I, I haven't seen a lot of oxen being yoked together. So that word sometimes doesn't have the weight that maybe it should. But if you know what that is, it's just a, a piece of wood, this yoke that, that keeps these two oxen walking in a line. And what I want you to notice is being yoked together means that one affects the other. What are you yoked to that when it pulls this way, it pulls you that way? And who are you letting speak into your life that when they say something, it affects you and it moves you in a certain direction? The, the word actually that they use to translate for, for yoke and fellowship here, it's a Greek word called koinonia. Many people, a lot of churches use that for fellowship. They'll have fellowship events called their koinonia night. And what that literally translates to is common fellowship. That means you're fellowshipping with those who are like you in koinonia fellowship. Be careful if you notice you're only spending time with people who aren't pursuing God the same way you are. Maybe they don't even believe in God. Doesn't mean you don't need to be nice to people, have friends that aren't... Jesus hung out with sinners, okay? That's not what I'm saying. But Jesus didn't have people that could speak into his life that weren't speaking the word of God and speaking truth. Jesus wasn't taking... He, he, his disciples and all of his followers, he instructed them, you don't need to be taking marriage advice from somebody who's cheating on their spouse. And that happens a lot. I'll notice men, they get around, they're like, my wife's just not good to me, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, where is this coming from? Well, so-and-so at work told me about his wife, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, they've been separated, you know, and he's been having an affair on her. That's usually what it boils down to. And so, again, you get defensive. You're in that, that mode, and you're starting to, to co- try to cover up your sin and cover up your fault. You've got to make a break with those things if you ever really want to change. You need to get a filter on your computer. You need to get some accountability with other people. Whatever it takes, make a break with that. Finally, the third thing that I want you to understand is that getting all this out of your life is hard to do. It really is. It can be painful having to move on from relationships, having to move on from things that you used to you know, really rely on to make you feel better. So you need to, number three, after you've gotten rid of excuses, after you've made the break, you need to fill the void. You've got to put something back in place of those things you've lost. This is the step that most people never make it to, and so this is why they never make it. Is they'll, they'll really say, man, today I want to do right They'll try to make a break with things, but they never replace it with anything good. And y'all, that'll leave you feeling empty. It'll be a gnawing at your soul. Y'all know the feeling. I've, I've gone through it. It's where you just say, life has no meaning. You know, uh, relationships just have no meaning. This is where something will fill that void. So if you remove all that stuff and don't replace it with something good, the enemy will try to fill it with, with harmful thoughts with bad behavior, with, you know, fill in the blank there of something not good. There's four things you can do to fill that void that we try to promote that I think everybody needs to do. First of all, it's pretty straightforward. You need to give your life to Jesus. And remember that scripture we read, you got to give everything, your life, not parts of it, not just a couple days a week or a couple of hours a week. And think about the commitment you make to, to Jesus. I wish church people were as committed as all the football fans are. I'd love to see church people cooking out in the parking lot, tailgating, getting ready for the service because they're so excited to be here. And I hear people all the time say, oh, church people. I don't like being around church people. They're so, you know, just judge, judgmental. They make you want to dress a certain way. You ever gone to a football game? Everybody dresses in the same team colors because they're trying to show their, who they're rooting for. People even paint their face. Y'all, I haven't painted my face up here in a long time. You know, they, they do all this. They act like we're weird for wanting to be together and, and pr- promote something really good. And y'all know me. I'm a football fan. I'm not making fun of you. But think of the commitment level. They're like, all they ever want is money. What is Jerry Jones wanting out of all his fans? It sure ain't to win them a Super Bowl, I'll tell you what. You know, all these football owners, they're trying to make money too. You know, 
at least ours is going to try to help people and not make billionaires more billions. You know, just all these things, the commitment. When you really give your life to Jesus, you got to be all in. Ephesians 5.18 gives us great instruction. It says, do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. People just get hung up on this, the issue of alcohol. Y'all, this is about so much more than alcohol. Don't get drunk on whatever it might be. Don't get drunk on wrong relationships, on pornography. Don't get, get drunk on greed. Don't get drunk on hate. Don't get drunk on anything that's going to lead to debauchery. Okay? That's what the heart of this is about if you read all that in Ephesians. Anything that... Because what happens when you get drunk is you lose control of yourself. That's what this is talking about. And anything you give over control of yourself to that is not God is the wrong side. You're giving it over to the wrong person. And it says, instead, be filled with the Spirit. That word debauchery there, it actually uh, would translate to extreme indulgence. Extreme indulgence of your senses. What happens there is your flesh, your body. Have you ever craved something? Like, again, I I keep saying Dr. Pepper, but it, it revealed a truth to me. My body craved it. I felt at the mercy, I wanted to give money to buy one. I wanted, even though I didn't want it. You hear me? You know what that feels like? You're like, I don't even want this, really. But something in me makes me feel like I need it. Again, you've got to give everything to Jesus so there's no room for that kind of stuff that can control you. Once you've given your life to Jesus, this next one may not be so obvious. You need to get in a small group. This is not some church I don't care what you call it. People get hung up on names, Sunday school, small groups, whatever. you got to get in a group of people. Jesus had disciples. He had 12 people, 12 men that he hung around. And then in that small group of 12 people, he had a small group of Peter, James, and John, Andrew, you know, that he really confided in. They were the ones with him as he was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane right before the crucifixions, the ones he really trusted and the ones he put more time in. You need that in your life. It says in Ecclesiastes 4 that... There was a man all alone. He had neither son or brother. There was no end to his toil. But two are better than one because they have a good return for their work. If one falls down, his friend can help him up. But pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. Alas, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. You see the principle here. A cord of three strands, if you can get another person, then you really are strong, then you'll not be quickly broken. Some of y'all can't change because you've been trying to do it alone. And, and what we're talking about with small groups, y'all, you don't need another sermon or another lesson. When we have small groups, really, we're, we're providing that. We hope you learn something. We want you to, to grow in that way. But can I tell you what you need more than another lesson? You need another friend. You need another advocate. Somebody to bear those burdens with you. You need that more... I, real life change, you hear us say this all the time, it doesn't happen, I, I'm not trying, I hope I don't put myself out of a job, it doesn't happen listening to a preacher just preach a sermon. That might be where you make a decision, you get inspired, but can I tell you where real life change happens? It's in your day-to-day life, where you get with people and you have to make those real decisions. Because right here, we can shout about it, we can talk about it, but then you got to go live it. And it's a whole lot easier to do when you have somebody that you can count on, somebody you can trust, somebody walk in this life with you. You need that small group of people. And the third thing, if somebody could come to the music, please, because these last two are so important, is that you need to find your real purpose in life. This is, you know, why so many people, I think, feel like their life is useless or meaningless. It's because what you're doing is really not what you were designed to do. There's nothing there that's really fulfilling. Uh, Making money is great. I hope y'all, can I just speak a blessing? I hope all of y'all make a whole bunch of money and pay a whole bunch of offering. Hallelujah. (laughs) But really, at the end of the day, who cares about money? The Bible says if I gain the whole world and lose my soul, it doesn't do me any good. It profits me nothing. When you die, you don't get to take your money with you. But what you do leave behind is the impact you make in people's lives. The impact you make in this world. The difference you make for the cause of Christ. That will echo on into eternity and into heaven. You need to find your purpose. Some of you are just frustrated at life. Can I tell you, it's probably because you're not living out things that, that you're supposed to do. That's, you hear us talk about growth track. That's a big point of it, is to help you discover your purpose. 
You, you take a giftings test. We interview you. We talk. Just let you talk through, you know, the things you're good at, the things that you may not realize. Man, I, I could be serving in this way or involved. And let me tell you, it's not some just sneaky way for us to get more volunteers. That's really not what we need. It's for your benefit as much or more than ours. Because I don't want you living a life that doesn't matter. I don't want you living a life where you feel like I'm just getting by. Nothing really matters. Those of you that have found a life in Christ, that you say, man, I'm making a difference. I know I'm, I'm investing in people. I'm discipling people. You know, that gets you through the hard days when you don't feel like doing the right thing. Anybody know what that's like? So like, I don't want to do it, but I know I need to, and it's important to me, and it's what I'm supposed to do. Because that's the final thing that we need to do is live your life for the good of others. So here's a promise I'll make to you. First, the promise I can't keep. I can't solve all your problems. Our church cannot solve all your problems. God can, but we can't. So what we're trying to do when we say find your purpose is we want to give you something bigger to focus on than your problem. Something more important to focus on. And what I believe that is, is this last step, which is live your life for the good of others. Don't live your life just trying to accumulate wealth, accumulate stuff. But live a life that's for other people. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10 says, Each one should use whatever gift he's received to serve others. And when you, when you think about this, Whatever God has blessed you with, he's blessed you with it so you can be a blessing to other people. There's an old song. I don't know if I'm putting Clint on the spot. He loves when I do this. Do you remember that song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus? Do you know how to play that? Anybody remember that one? I, just pick a key. I, don't, I have decided to follow Jesus. This is going good. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided, some of y'all know it, to follow Jesus. This is the part I like. No turning back. No turning back. Sing that one more time if you would. I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus I have decided to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back We'll sing like little songs like that. I, I've sang that since I was a kid. And the weight of those words has really started to hit me. I've decided to follow Christ. The path of Jesus leads to self-sacrifice. It leads to living your life for the good of others. That's all Jesus... Please realize this. Coming to the earth and living and dying for us did not benefit Jesus personally. He was God before he got here and he was God while he was here and he was God after he left. It didn't add a penny to his riches in heaven. It didn't add one iota of strength to his power. He was fully God the whole time. Amen. He did it for us. And what I want you to do if you really want to change something in your life is you've got to make this final decision. It's not a blank for you to fill in. You've got to decide if God is really Lord of your life and, and start taking these steps. You know, give your life to Him. Get involved with, with a, a group of people you can trust and be accountable to. Discover your purpose. Do something meaningful with your life that is for the good of other people. Because see, here's the truth I want you to remember. If God is not Lord of all, He's really not Lord at all. It's all or nothing, saints. In a way that I could say it even maybe more straightforward is you've got to stop living your life just to feel good and live your life to do good. That's the example Jesus left for us. It, it didn't feel good to, to go onto that cross, to walk that walk of shame that he did for us. But he did it because he loved us. When you start caring about other people and their problems and their situations and the world around you, you'll care a lot less about that Dr. Pepper. 
or whatever it is. It's your comfort. It's your hang up. It's your bad habit. That's how you really change is make it not about you. People will get hung up for years trying to fix this problem and it's because they're just focusing on that problem that they never overcome it. But when they focus on something greater than that problem, it kind of becomes, you know, a minor detail. I want to invite you to stand if you're able, please. Because I want to pray with you and, and pray for you. If, if our prayer team would come and be ready to pray with anybody that, that needs prayer this morning. I know there's several here that you've, you've got needs in your life that you need prayer. and We're going to open the altars. I, I want everybody to have opportunity. If you've got any need in your life, in your family, whatever it might be, we want to pray for you. We want to be available to you. The Lord can help you right now today. You don't have to wait for help. We'd love to be in agreement with prayer. But first, I want to ask if there's anybody here, and you can stay looking around. I think this is an important decision to make publicly. You say, I got stuff in my life that I, I came in today really wanting to change. And today, I'm going to stop making excuses, and I'm making a decision to follow Christ. I'm not going to focus on that thing. I'm going to try to put some of these things in place. It, it may be a process. Again, it's one step at a time. But today you're taking that first step. If that's you, would you just raise your hand with me? I got some things. Say, I'm not making excuses. I'm going to make a change. Several of us. Praise God for your boldness. I'm, I'm committing that with you. That, that I, want to, I want to make that difference in my life. Now I want to ask if you would to bow your heads and close your eyes because there's a different group of people. And this decision, I think, is very personal. It's between you and God. As you say, really, the first thing I need to change is to give my life to Jesus. I really have not, either I've never served him or I'm really not serving him right now. And I need to make a real commitment to him this morning. If that's you and the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart, you, you want to make this good decision. Would you slip your hand up real quickly? I'd like to pray for you. Say, I'm going to make that commitment to Christ. Yeah, anybody else? You can put your hand right back down. Praise God. Yeah, anyone else? Amen. It's between you and the Lord. I want to pray for all of us today to make that change. And while I'm praying, please hear me. If you need prayer for anything, we want to be here to pray for you. Some are already moving to the altars. If it's not something I mentioned, but you need prayer for something specific, that's what we're here for. This is that small group, being able to be there for one another. We want to pray one for another. So the altars will be open. I'll dismiss everybody, but you come and pray and stay as long as you need, as long as you desire. And, and I believe the Lord can help you and set you free today, whatever your need might be. But right now, for those of you making that commitment to the Lord, I'm praying for you and those of you making that commitment to change. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we speak first for those alongside those that are saying they want to make a real decision to follow you, to give their life to you, Lord. Father, we confess that we are sinners. We've all made mistakes. The Bible says all have sinned and fall short of your glory. And we are just thankful that Jesus made a way back to you. So we ask for your forgiveness. We repent and want to turn away. We want to get away from that old life and have that new life promised by you and so God we're done with excuses we're making a break and we want to fill that void with you in our life save us right now I pray change their hearts and do what your word says that when we confess our sins you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us I declare that they are a new creature right now in the name of Jesus in Jesus name and father for those that are praying to overcome bad habits worry, stress, depression, whatever it might be that we filled in the blank that we wanted to change. I pray that right now you give them hope where there used to be hopelessness, that they realize that is not their identity, that they would no longer associate themselves with that past, but they would be free to walk in victory through these steps you show us in your word. We believe it. We receive it right now in the name of Jesus. And all in agreement said, would somebody give the Lord praise in this place for all he's done this morning? Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Praise you, Jesus. Now, church, I'm going to hope you don't get tired of me praying. I'm going to speak one last blessing over you so you can be dismissed and go. But please, if you need prayer, 
I know some have said they had a specific need. Just move while I'm praying. Come forward and I'd love to pray with you and then the rest of y'all are dismissed. Would you bow your hearts with me? Father, keep us safe till we join together again next time. Thank you for speaking your word. Now let us go live your word. In the name of Jesus, I declare. And all the church of the living God said, amen. Amen. Go with God. Y'all have a great week.